All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards. I work for the University of Wyoming Extension. I'm uh, located in the Torrington, Wyoming area. And my co-host, as always, is Jeremiah Bartman. Uh, he is up in the other, uh, the northern half of Wyoming. He's up in the Powell, Cody area. He's an extension educator for the University of Wyoming as well. How are you doing, Jeremiah? Doing good this morning. How about yourself? Pretty good. Good to see you again. Uh, we have our, our guest that wants to be on camera today is Jacqueline Downey. Uh, she is from Wyoming Audubon. Thank you for joining us, Jacqueline. We're really happy that you're here. And, yes, her, and her support is Zach Hutchinson, uh, although he, uh, he, he just is there to uh, provide sound files for Jacqueline and, and other technical services. Phone a friend, I think is how we're, how we're dealing with that. Um, so thank you, Jack for, uh, Zach, for joining us, and um, uh, we hope uh, it's worth your while today. A um, couple of things that we need to cover. If you're new to Zoom, um, take your uh, pointer or your mouse, and if you scroll over the, the surface of the uh, meeting, you'll be able to see a Q&A at the bottom. You can ask us questions at any point in time using that venue or through the chat button. Um, and uh, if you are on Facebook Live participating there, our uh, uh, we're monitoring that as well. And if you have questions through Facebook Live, they can be channeled to us or through Jacqueline, through to Jacqueline to answer. Uh, I, before I forget, I would also like to mention that um, Jennifer Thompson, Jenny Thompson is uh, also a specialist for the University of Wyoming. She is uh, in the background. Uh, providing technical support to all of us and uh, keeping us on track and uh, uh, funneling those questions or a lot of the questions and those types of things to us. So uh, you may hear her voice at any point in time. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this presentation today. And Jacqueline, I'm going to turn it over to you. Unless I forgot something, Jeremiah. Did I get everything? No. No, I okay. think you nailed it. I think we're ready right. to roll. So we'll First just turn it ever. over to Jacqueline and, and we'll start your presentation. Sounds good. Well, thank you all for, for um, inviting me to come. Kind of a fun and easy thing to talk about birds, especially, especially now. If you're just on Facebook now and you're seeing I, you can... Go ahead and let me know who you are um, as far as I, how you feel about birds. So you can go ahead and put that in the uh, chat or the Q&A or um, in a comment section on Facebook. So feel free to do that. I'm hoping you all will be interactive. And if you have questions, please just, just let me know. All right, so yeah, we are gonna talk about uh, birds Spring birds in Wyoming. Uh, right now, I don't know if you all have been waking up to the sound of birds. I know I have. It's very loud and um, really entertaining this time of the year. And it's uh, always just so great to finally get the birds back after our dreary winters. Uh, so I do work for Audubon Rockies. It's the National Audubon Society's um, regional office that serves um, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. And I do the education and outreach. So I have the fun job of working with kids and getting outside in nature and doing fun stuff like this, um, doing some bird banding, um, really just trying to um, engage the public. If you are a homeschool parent, um, I'll let you know that we do have a lot of resources on our website. Um, a few years back, Zach and I wrote this, this book here about sagebrush adventures of a burrowing owl. And this is available free for download or you can get in touch with me and I can see if I can send you one. We've got things like this um, pollinator pals. You can follow uh, Harley and she goes around um, talking about pollinating and all the cool pollinator friends. And there's just a lot of um, do DIY stuff, things like that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with David Allen Sibley, but he's an artist who does illustrations for bird guides. And he has a few clips where you can actually see if you can draw a bird like David Allen Sibley. So if you do, I'd love to see 
the results. I, I don't have any artistic ability, Jacqueline, so I don't think I could even attempt, but, you know, I'm going to have to look that up and give it a try just for my son's sake, so. Yeah, I think, you know what, you never know till you try. So. <laughs> right, right. All right, well, uh, we're just, like I said, you know, talking about birds um, in Wyoming and kind of learning a little bit about what may be at home, things that, that we can do. Um, that will encourage them to come visit us. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I, I do look forward to spring and the birds. And one of my favorite ones this year so far has been the sandhill cranes. Uh, they arrived and uh, usually I hear them overhead in the fall and the spring, but this year they did stop in our, one of our fields. And so we got to watch them, which was, which was really cool. Zach, whenever you get a chance, if you wanna let us know what they sound like. So if you don't know, All right, so that sound, I, yeah. It's, it's, they're usually really faint, um, flying overhead, and it's kind of fun when you're working outside your yard and you think, oh, hey, there's the sand hills. So you start looking around and they're really high. It's amazing yeah. how far that, that the sound, their call will travel. Uh, yeah. So it, it, we, we enjoy seeing them fly over and, and uh, watching for them. Yeah, for sure. You know, we get so, you know, people always think that, that the animals they have nearby, maybe they're not as impressed with them. They don't think they've got the cool stuff. You know, we don't have flamingos or ostriches or, you know, toucans. But I would argue that these guys are phenomenal. And if we did not have them in Wyoming, then, you know, we would be jealous of other places for having them. So I, I, they are ones that I think are, are pretty cool. Uh, one of the, the really neat things is they have these cool courtship dances. And so that's, if they do land, you do get a chance to view them to watch them do these elaborate um, displays is pretty cool. And I'll just throw out that Zach recently did a fun uh, humorous video about crane courtship. So if you are interested in that, you may also wanna check out the website of Audubon Rockies. All so is right. that just the male okay, cranes so that Jeff do that? and Jeremiah, yeah, yep. As, as per usual, we, this us females kind of sit by and watch you guys make a fool out of yourselves uh, for the most part. <laughs> naturally, <laughs> naturally. That's our role well, in the world. I, Jeremiah, I think that was our cue to keep our mouths shut during this pre program today. <laughs> I, I think so. I'll try. I'll try my best. That's very, very challenging for me. <laughs> All right. Well, um, one of our, I, so, for me, the first bluebirds, that is the sign of spring. And I know I'm picking a fight with some birders and uh, folks out there who uh, have different opinions of what the true bird of spring is, but I'm gonna go ahead and declare Wyoming's bird of spring to be the mountain bluebird. Um, they are absolutely brilliant blue. We get the males that come in uh, the end of February, at least that's when they come for around us. And um, then the females will follow shortly thereafter. Um, I have an example of if you feel like you see them and you would like to encourage them to stick around or to build nests near you, um, you can um, easily with spare and scrap wood create a, a bluebird house. Jacqueline, um, if, we might, if we might interject, um, yeah. if you can stop sharing your screen, they sure. will be able to see if you hold up the bluebird house. Yeah, you we'll okay. ju you'll just be a little bit larger so we can see you better. Okay, perfect. So there are a lot of different um, plans online that you can go and get. There's kits, um, but uh, so bluebird houses, you can do a tray of, of, of them. I'll show you what a completed product okay, looks like, maybe. There you go, right there. So, and that can just be out of scrap lumber if you had it laying around? Yeah, old signs. I know that a lot of the state parks will utilize some of their old and retired signs, and they'll cut mm. those up and use those when they're kind of made out of a particle, particle wood. Um, barn wood, if you, like I said, scrap wood, they don't, you know, as long as it's untreated and, um, you know, is not, you, typically you don't want to paint them. Um, but um, they're not, they're not too picky and as long as it's, you know, safe and not hazardous for them, then it'll work out. Um, 
do they need to um, uh, be taken down and cleaned out or uh, hardly any maintenance to them? What, what do we, do we need to worry about that? Yeah, you should in the fall, you should definitely clean, clean it out. Um, it's okay. just so surprising how early in the spring they come back. So if you wait till then, you'll probably miss them. But yeah, you can go ahead. They'll build it right back again. If you don't clean them out, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's just that they'll start to build on top of each other. And I don't know if you've ever seen uh, bluebird houses or any bird houses, and they start to have all their building materials sticking out of here. And that just means they've, they're over overrun. And that way they can just, you know, have a fresh clean nest for the new year. It's, it's full. It's time to clean it out. That's right. That's, That's what right. happens at my house too. So, um, Jacqueline, <laughs> we got a question. Um, sure. The bluebirds are definitely in the bighorns right now, but the snow is everywhere and deep. What on earth do they eat? Right. So yeah, bluebirds are insect eaters. Um, and uh, they will, they will find there's if right now, if you, if you look and see there are, there are insects that have started to come back. So there's that, that they're coming back. But um, Zach, do you know specifically what they are eating right now besides the insects that are available? Are they doing seeds or what are your, so what's your thought there? Bluebirds will also feed on uh, Russian olive seeds and native uh, berries, um, uh, especially junipers during the, cause some bluebirds will stick around in winter and they'll live in juniper forests where ample juniper berries exist. Okay. They were eating our Katoni aster berries, which had been sitting there all winter long. And so they must be palatable now. So they're eating them when they came to our house. At least the bluebirds I've seen, they're very plump and happy. So whatever it is they're eating, there must be a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, we have another question for you, um, Jacqueline. So how high should a bluebird house be mounted and which direction should it face? Right. So you definitely want it to be um, at least five foot tall. Um, so that kind of does with, fen I know we put them all along fence posts, but that's why you'll notice that a lot of them do have this mounting part back here. And so depending on how high you need to, to, to get it, you know, you can extend this part out. Um, so at least five foot, you don't want to go um, too high. I wouldn't go above 12 foot um, for bluebirds anyway, but you can do that. Um, the other thing is you want to have them be about 300 feet apart. So if you're going to do a bluebird trail, and if you've seen some of these, and definitely in the big horns, there's some examples of those in, um, here in Northeast Wyoming too. They're um, 300 feet apart if you're going to do that so that they, because otherwise they will fight with each other. And that actually brings up another good point is that if you have bluebirds that start fighting, you may think about putting up at least one more bluebird house and stop that, stop that bickering. <laughs> so Jacqueline, when you're talking about the bluebirds and the, the plans for the nesting box, we have that up as a article that Jacqueline wrote and it's on our barnyards and backyard site. So I put the link in the chat box on Zoom and also on the Facebook page that'll take you to the barnyards and backyards wildlife page. And if you look under birds, a lot of Jacqueline's articles are under there for easy finding. Well, and that might be a good plug, uh, Jenny, to say if you'd like to have that Barnyards and Backyards magazine for those articles that Jacqueline has written and others, uh, to v visit the Barnyards and Backyards website and get that uh, magazine coming to you as a subscription. So, yeah, what else, Jacqueline? All right. Well, okay. So one of the things I was going to do, I'm going to talk about a few common, uh, a common birds that some of you may know already, but then... Also some others that you might confuse. I think in Wyoming, another thing we think is that there's not that many birds. And in fact, there are, you just may not notice how, how they are actually different. So in the very same type of houses, um, tree swallows are also um, abundant and they also use the same house. They can be really aggressive and that's another case where if you start to notice that they are um, sort of harassing your bluebirds, then again, you may want to think about adding some more um, houses. So uh, these guys are, are great. They are very beautiful. Jacqueline, you can see how the, they have that iridescent blue. Uh, I'm sorry, are, they, um, are the mountain bluebirds, are they found throughout Wyoming in the spring or are they uh, more 
I, know, I wouldn't say restricted, but are they more common in higher elevations? Um, are they everywhere? They're pretty much everywhere in Wyoming. Um, Zach, maybe you could speak to if there's spots where they don't exist, but as far as I know in the places that I frequent, and pretty much you can see them everywhere. The one that gets a little different is that we also, there's also the Western and the Eastern bluebirds. And you'll notice that those, if you ever have bluebirds and there's some sort of red on them anywhere on their, on their chest, the chances are you have either a Western or an Eastern. Um, and so those birds are not found everywhere in Wyoming, but. Okay, thank you. We do have, we do have another question. Are you, okay. would you, about the bluebird houses. Um, okay. I was told the size of the entrance hole on the box has to be its specific diameter or size. Is that correct? Yeah, if, so if you want, and I'll go back just to the picture of the bluebird, just so we know what we're talking about. Um, so it's one and nine sixteenths is the very specific size for mountain bluebirds. Um, not all, not all um, pre-made birdhouses will have that size. They'll be a little bit bigger and that's fine. They'll like them too. It's just um, if you have a problem with birds that are raiding their nests and you want to make sure okay. that just the mountain bluebird is is using that house, that's when you want to be a little bit more specific. Um, but yeah, one and nine sixteenths is the the specific one for these guys. Not an inch and a half, but an inch and nine sixteenths. <laughs> Don't forget that extra sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Um, another one of our brave birds in the spring is uh, Robin, right? We've all seen these. These are um, so much fun, especially when they nest around your house, because you can usually actually kind of watch the whole process. So that's, that's really fun. Um, but they, a lot of times we think of them as being, um, you know, birds of spring, but in Wyoming, they actually are here pretty much year round. They may kind of uh, go other places. They'll go to where, you know, there's food availability and cover and all that, but um, you may not see them as frequently. Um, sometimes, I, there'll be sometimes in the winter, I'll see a mob of them. So it just really depends, but they don't abandon us necessarily in, in Wyoming in the winter. Well, that's why you don't really consider them the birds of spring then. That's why right. That's why the, the other gets it, the mountain bluebird, that's right? right? Yes. I, I have one of these building a nest in my front, uh, tree right out my front door. So I'll be able to watch it this year. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so another bird that you may um, think of when it comes to uh, a similar looking bird that also likes to nest around your house um, are these Say's Phoebes. And I, I have to imagine that a lot of uh, Wyoming landowners see these guys and just think, oh, that's just kind of a pale, pale, rob pale robin. But no, they're a whole entire different type of of um, a bird and um, they are, um, they're really fun and fascinating to watch as well. For these guys, they actually like platforms. So if you have an outbuilding that there's some sort of flat platform that's kind of high up, that, that's where they'll like to build their nest. Hmm. So. All right. I can't say so, that I've ever seen one of these. Well, now that you know, if you ever see a robin you think is pale, <laughs> then I would suggest taking another look and seeing if it is a Sage Phoebe. And they're kind of telltale. Um, it's just they're small. They're overall a little bit smaller, but they also have these little whiskers that are coming out because they're, um, that's the kind of bird that they are. They have those. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the clue there. All right. So the uh, Western Meadowlark, Jeremiah, you see you've got your your friend and co-worker there with you. Um, yep. These guys, yeah, the, this are, is, I, uh, I would consider. This is our family bird for spring. So uh, in our family, when the first meadowlark that sings, that is the sign of spring for our family. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Zach. That's right. Yep. Yeah, they are definitely fun to hear and they definitely sound like spring to me. Um, and you're often going to see these guys perched up. They're Wyoming state bird. Um, 
but we can't feel too special about that because there's like seven other states that also claim the Western Meadowlark is their state bird. So I don't know where we lacked that sense of cre uh, creative um, thought process there for, cre for choosing that, but oh well, they're great and they do sound like spring in Wyoming. Um, another bird, especially if you're on the eastern part of the state, um, that likes to perch on fence, and I know he looks so different when you get a chance to look at him right here, but if you're just driving along, if you're on your four-wheeler or you're walking or driving by a fence post, and you might see a, a bird that looks like this. They, they can fool you into thinking maybe they're also a meadowlark, and they have a very cool sound as well. Maybe. I like to call it the wolf whistle. It's kind of like the whoo whoo, but kind of long and exaggerated. So when you're out and about and gardening or doing something, at least here at the ranch, um, you hear them and kind of have to take offense to it, but they're, they are great. They're beautiful. And <laughs> <we'll be confused. laughs> All right, so now some quiz time. Um, here we've got three of our uh, most probably common feeder birds, especially in Wyoming. And my question to you all out there is if you can identify what they are. So while so, you're pondering that, I'm just going to, yeah. So Jeremiah and I took this quiz the other day, and I think both of us were about 30%. So just to let yeah. everybody else know. <laughs> we did not do as well. We're, we, we are, we need to brush up on our birder skills there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so go ahead and type in the chat box if you want uh, what your your thoughts are or what your which bird you think is on on there. Uh, we have Annie said a finch and a chickadee and a question mark. So she has two out of three guesses there for you. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to stop my share for just a minute and I'm going to share with you um some common bird feeders and the seed that I would suggest and also the seed I would not suggest for Wyoming. Um, so you can continue to participate and um, chime in. In the meantime, I'll stop that for a sec. Okay, so um, first I'll just start off with the seed I don't recommend because it's a seed that's most often found in stores. And that's, I don't know if you can see this, it's these mixtures. It's like a bird seed mix. And I would never recommend this for our birds in Wyoming. The birds in Wyoming are gonna pick out all the light colored seeds, whoop, there. And, <laughs> and- Just um, like that. <laughs> just like that, yeah. So if you're ever having these problems with having bird, you know, uh, either deer or squirrels, or you're having problems with um, birds that are mobbing your feeders, it'll make a world of difference if you just get rid of those. Cause our birds don't like it. They get rid of them and then they're just littered all over the flat the floor underneath your feeders. Um, the ones I do recommend are this black oil sunflower seed, and then these tiny little black thistle seeds called nidder thistle seeds. And here's just one seed, it's, they're tiny. Okay. Um, okay. So the tiny seeds, you can put them in a feeder like this, these little sock feeders, you can get fancier, more elaborate ones. Um, this one is great because um, it's got a cage and that way you don't have, um, you know, squirrels or whatever else, um, you know, larger birds that may come and raid your feeder. So this is a good one. You can also make this yourself with some chicken wire. Um, this guy right here is um, a suet feeder. So it would hang like this and they come up here and they have a variety of these kinds. And basically it's just fat. Um, and that's for a certain type of bird um, that likes that. Um, and then here's a good one for if you're going to do um, the uh, uh, black oil sunflower seed. So these are some some types that you can use. So um, three types of seed are three types of food, um, and I think you've got it. You've got it covered for most all of Wyoming birds, including the ones that are on the uh, quiz here. So Jacqueline, we have a question for you from Allison. With the thistle seed, do you have to worry about that seed germinating and spreading? No, I, not, not really. You can get the, with the sunflower seeds, 
they can be, um, they can go wild. They will, they can do that. Um, the thistle, seed, this type of thistle seed is not the same as our invasive types of thistles that you all work so hard to combat. But um, you can, if it's a problem, um, you can get sunflower seed that's been treated um, so that it will not be able to germinate. So we got really lucky last year outside of Laramie. We had a ton of goldfinches that stuck around for a long time and they really love that Niger seed. And when I looked into it, it looked like most of it had been heat treated to kill it so that it wouldn't germinate, which set our minds yeah. at rest. So a sterile seed essentially being sold to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. I got a question. So with these bird feeders, do you need to try and match the bird feeder with the size of, of seed that you're putting in those? Does that matter? And one for, of course, holding the seed, but two for, for the, the birds in particular of being able to get access to those seeds. Is that of concern or not really? Yeah. So like this, this uh, feeder ball right here, this has got the, the black oil sunflower seeds that I recommend. Um, and you can see that they're able to be held in there pretty easily. It's a very similar thing as, as this one here, right? And then um, this one, you can see it's got the little holes and that is for the thistle seed. Um, and that allows so that there's not a whole lot of waste and it's the same kind of thing. This right here, this one you can fill with thistle or with black oil sunflower seed, but I typically use this one for thistle. Great. We have another question on feeding birds. So sure. in the springtime, feeding birds stale bread, does that do any harm for the birds? Um, well, I, I think they've come up with some new studies that they think maybe it, it, it does if it's, if it's uh, you know, taken in a lot. I mean, it's not something that, that birds should be eating. It's not, a, it's not an actual food source for them. Uh, will it kill them? Probably not. Um, but uh, you know, if you can provide them with something that more closely matches uh, their food, um, then that is best. Great. All right. We have another guess at the birds. So a finch and tanager. Oh, that's so that's close. Well, we have a house finch. So right, one of them, the one that's kind of drab yellow is a goldfinch. And you may not have guessed that because you're used to seeing them be so bright, but in the wintertime and females, they tend to be drab, have that drab color. The males are the ones that look like this one I'm showing now. And this is their breeding plumage. So this is their please pay attention to me ladies um, outfit that they're wearing for the summertime. Um, and so these are the ones that we typically notice and pay attention to. But um, the picture previous here, that's also a goldfinch, the little drab brown one. And yes, so we have also have our house finches. Um, right here you can see them and you can see this one um has the um the black oil sunflower seed in a, a feeder like this only without the cage and uh this one um i will say that these house finches are are really social birds so you'll usually see a bunch of them at once so this is the ones that would have a hard time maintaining their social distancing during this time all right, and then yes, the last one is going to be the black capped chickadee. Uh, it is the cutest bird at your feeders, I bet. And, um, but don't let their cuteness, they are tough, tough birds. They have so many different adaptations. They stay with us in the winter time. Um, you know, they'll, they'll actually, you can find them eating. Um, these are the ones that we use this type of feeder for. They like fat, and that's because they have to stay here in the winter time. Um, and it gives them they, the fat that they need. To they have no choice, so they have to be <laughs> they have to be given fat, so they have enough energy, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. So here we have um, everyone's. Um, you know, they have a hard time with the little brown birds. So here's another photo quiz, and I'm. Jeff and I did not have as much hard time with the the little brown birds. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait a minute. Well, they're all, yeah, we did. <laughs> Little brown birds. We got them all right. Little brown right. birds. Very easy to identify. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So here's where I'm going to recommend a few things. First off, this is probably my favorite bird guide. Um, 
So, so can you unshare yeah. yourself and, and show yes. the book? Sorry, we had, sorry about no. that. No, it's okay. So Sibley's Guide to Bird, this is a big one, but look how big this is. It's, it's, it's enormous. The, but it's really uh, colorful and a good, a good illustration and a good book. Yes. My, my second go-to sort of guide is this Birds of Wyoming. Um, it, I mean, if you're just kind of backyard birding or just kind of driving around looking at birds, this one right here is all, all that you will need. Um, and then I can also recommend on your phone, if you have um, access, there's free app. One of them is the Audubon bird app. And it's really great because it helps you kind of narrow down what you're looking at. So you can literally go in and say, identify a bird. And then we're in Wyoming, it's, this, it's in April. You can put the size of the bird. Um, you can put, so those were small. The color, there's a lot of brown going on there. The type of bird, it's kind of like, you know, a perching bird, okay? And you keep going through this and it'll spit out for you all of the type of birds that it could possibly be. So super helpful if you're a new bird. And it also helps you figure out how you can go about trying to identify a bird too, because so, you do so field look for those things. Jacqueline, if there are people from other states who are participating, can they use those apps for their location as well? Yes, the Audubon Bird Guide is is um, is all through the nation. Okay. Um, you can even get different editions for like the Caribbean and Mexico and all those types of places. Um, so I recommend that, that can really help you out. Um, so um, let's see, I'll go back to the slideshow here. Okay, all right, Has, was anybody ever able to identify any of those birds? I haven't we, seen any come through yet, any, yeah. but they might not have had enough time to really look at it. Okay. Well, so going from um, the top left there, this little guy you probably will see um, in, your, in your garden, especially if you kind of have a lot of shrubs, uh, that's our house wren. And this is a very noisy bird. Um, and when he, I haven't seen them arrive yet. They tend to arrive a little bit later um, in the spring than some other birds do. But when they arrive, you'll know it because they are, they are kind of noisy. Um, and they're also really gregarious and they're kind of sneaky birds. And, you know, there's a lot of courtship stuff that happens that's a little questionable. So they, they look unassuming and brown, but they really have a lot going on. Um, and what you might notice is that this guy, the, the, the uh, house wren, he is a lot different than the other three. The other three have a very different type of beak. You'll notice that it's really conical. Um, and uh, whereas this other guy is kind of, it's a little bit longer. So that's one thing when you're out there ID, IDing birds, you can kind of keep in mind on what does the beak look like? What's the shape of it? And that kind of helps you narrow things down. And then you can see this guy in the very bottom corner, he's got this black line with the white. He's very, very distinguishing. Um, and if you look at the guy above him, he also has that, but it's like a brown and a white. So these are the things you can kind of take a look at. Are there stripies? You know, what's it doing? These are things before you even grab your bird book, you can look at those things. All right, so we have a house wren and then moving over, we have our song sparrow. Uh, pine siskin is the stripy one down at the bottom and then the little mohawk looking one, that is our white crown sparrow. Little, little brown birds. LBJs, yeah. right? LBJs, little brown jobs. <laughs> That's right. Um, kind of a fun thing, even if you're not seeing birds as you can do is also kind of try and figure out what you're looking at feather-wise. And um, I found this cool feather and maybe you wouldn't have been able to identify what it was, but this is actually from a blue heron and they're so distinctive. So as you're going around hiking, especially if you've got kiddos with you, even if you don't see birds, finding things like feathers and nests are kind of a neat thing to do and try to identify them. All right, so I know what you've all been waiting for is to talk about hummingbirds. Um, so in, in Wyoming, we've got quite a few different types of, of hummingbirds. Uh, these ones uh, are, are common ones that we get in Wyoming. Uh, we have the broad-tailed and the calliope. So 
that's how I pronounce it, but you're welcome to have your own interpretation. We, we have another question in the chat box, Jacqueline, and I'm not sure which bird they're specifically talking about. So if Dixie can uh, type another question of which slide we were on, but the question was, do the different sexes look very different? And, and again, I don't know if that was on the herring or on, on those little brown birds. I'm not sure. It was probably the little brown birds. Yeah, it, it depends um, on the species. Robins look like robins, male or female. Um, you know, if you can think of, I always, want the very characteristic thing would, would be um, like a mallard. You think about the females are that drab brown and you get the male and he's got that just emerald green and the bright yellow beak. Um, so um, it's called dimorphic plumage, and it's just that they males and females have different um, plumage, and it just really depends on on the bird. Um, you know, you'll see typically if you've got very distinctive coloration. You know, if we have our house wrens, those guys, even when you have them in your hand, good luck figuring out how old they are or if they're male or female. Whereas, um, you, know, you know, we have our white crown sparrow here. He's got that real distinguishing black, you know, on a male and a female, it'll be a lot different, which can be tricky. And sometimes- But it's probably it's a subtle difference, right? Um, sometimes, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you would never guess. Uh, you could look at a bird and, and be so completely thrown off and think you've got two different types of birds. And really you are just looking at you know, a male and a female. Um, That's why so plants and like... insects are so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and, plants and they don't move still. as much, right? And yes. they don't move, as right? As before. much, right? Yeah. Jacqueline, I understand that juvenile plumage can be different than the adult as well, which adds in another little twist on some birds. Yeah, it, it, it does. So we run a bird banding station um, and, and Zach does as well uh, throughout, the, throughout the state of Wyoming. And ours is over here by Keyhole State Park. Uh, and our job is to figure out if we're looking at um, males or females and how old each bird is. And it is, those, those wrens are the worst. They're hard to get out of the nets. And then when you get them in your hand, you can't, they're, they're just horrible. But some of them are really, really easy. To um, talk to to figure out how old they are. Now Zach has can look at their skull and just like a baby when their when their soft spot you know fills in, there's holes on the skull that you can look at windows I should say, and um, to determine how old they are. That's one way, and that one's really hard. And I'm still I'm still um, perfecting that technique. So so Jacqueline, you're telling us that Zach is that good. He can do that, huh? I mean, who's, who's there to say that that he's not just making it up? Uh, oh, come on, come on, Zach. Now you have to defend yourself. I think <laughs> educated <laughs> guess. I think. I I say it's the the peepers that uh, my mama and daddy blessed me with. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but otherwise it is. It's about the feather, the feathers on the wings, mainly and how they're growing in. Birds go through different um, molts, which is when um, they've, they've, they've um, lost some of their feathers in a very um, specific way, and then they grow them back. And when they're growing back there, it's called molt. And the way that they do it is very um, ordered, and you, so you can tell exactly what's happening. Some birds are really cool, like uh, bald eagles who are like you know three or four before they fully mature. Um, they have all kinds of crazy things that are happening in between that you can kind of look at. And same things with um, woodpeckers. They're also pretty cool. The other one that's kind of cool are owls because their feathers have... Zach, do you want to jump in and explain that so I don't murder it? But they literally do glow in the dark and that's one way you can tell how old they are. So wow. when, when the, the feather from the owl bursts out of its shaft as it's growing in, um, it, it's covered in a chemical called porphyrin and it fluoresces neon pink under black light. And it's, it's a way to age the feathers because then as the feathers, you know, are exposed to sunlight and they're being used, that chemical wears off. And so newer feathers are, are easy to identify because they're bright pink under black light and older feathers are less pink. I think wow. we now need to go try that. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Let's go get some owls and try it. 
No, you know, that's the great thing about this program is that there's always something for us to learn, right? For everyone. I, yeah. I had never even heard that before. That's crazy. That's, that is so cool. <laughs> well, I have something even kind of a cool thing also to talk about with um, our, the, the coloration that you're seeing there on the hummingbirds, on their feathers, on their, on their, on their neck there. It's, so you're just, not actually seeing a pigmented color. Just so you know, Jacqueline, there's a little bit of a lag time between when you change slides. Oh, and okay. when oh we can see them. Yeah, it's there okay. now. So this 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 red coloration isn't pigment, but it's actually trapped air that's refracting light in a certain way, and it's it's presenting itself in this color for you. So that's Another that. fascinating fact. That's crazy. In, yeah, insects. Better. Insects are similarly iridescent. Yeah. Are they? Just, okay. Just yeah, just based on how their uh, exoskeleton is shaped, it's sim same type of thing. <clears throat> oh, cool. We have a question, Jacqueline, on on hummingbirds. So this comes in from Michael. Uh, is it possible to make a DIY hummingbird feeder? Yes, absolutely. Lots of different. Again, you can go to Audubon Rocky's website or even Audubon's website. And there's a variety of different styles and types of, um, of hummingbird feeders that you can make. I mean, it's as simple as using a, a, a washed um, plastic bottle. Um, that's, you know, um, I will say that if you're gonna use a bird feeder for hummingbirds, you do not need to dye the sugar water uh, red. That's not necessary for them to have that. You could paint the feeder red or put red on the feeder because hummingbirds are attracted to that, but you need not put it and you sh should not put it in the hummingbird. Uh, so it'd be better not to use dye in the, f in the juice itself, right? The sugar water, but um, have a red coloring on the outside of the feeder to attract them. Is that what you're saying? Yep, yep. So my mother then, is a avid um, hummingbird feeder and watcher and she has tried multiple times to give me uh, hummingbird feeders. I've purchased my own and uh, it, regardless of the source, I have busted every single one of them accidentally, really not on purpose. And um, maybe I need to do the DIY plastic feeder <laughs> and see if I can keep one around a little bit longer. <laughs> I find hummingbird feeders to be really high maintenance and <laughs> I, which is why I'm, I typically don't, don't do that. You know, you, you got to get the sugar water and that whole process and you don't want to let it sit there and ferment. Um, so for me, I find that flowers are the best bet, which is such a good, that's where I was kind of headed with this conversation to begin with. Here's another of, of the types we have. Me types too. Of, uh, hummingbirds, I should say. With the but, flowers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I originally um, had you can hummingbird feeders out, and I found that eventually, when I planted enough flowers, they were actually started to ignore them a bit, and so that's the point where I said, "Well, you know, I'll just go with the flowers and keep them fed that way." And it's really an entertaining thing to watch in your backyard. So Jacqueline, do we have hummingbirds everywhere in the state or are they in only pockets of areas or things like that? They really like mountainy areas. Um, that's so you do find them in the big horns. I know a ton. Um, you know, where where flower the flowers that they are going to want to visit exist, then they're likely to be there. Um, they're really kind of a short, a short um, Wyoming visitor though. You know, they've got a lot of places to go and they don't have very much time to do it. So they, they, uh, they don't, they stick around, um, you know, some of them may through maybe August, but there's other um, species that, you know, they may only be there for a few weeks at a time. So, so Jacqueline in the Goshen County area, we usually have them show up in August. I'm guessing that they're migrating on their way south at that point in time. Uh, they're usually only around for a couple of weeks, not very long, it seems, and um, uh, uh, they do prefer the flowers that we have out. And 
I, we have a comment from Diane that she agrees with you that uh, uh, feeders are high maintenance and um, plant lots of flowers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so Jacqueline, we got a question from Dixie again. Do they migrate through Laramie at different times? Uh, yes. And actually for this question, I will, I will throw it back at Zach again because he actually watches bird migrations through uh, weather radar tracking software. So that's, that's a thing that you can do. And so I'll throw that back at him. So uh, depending on the species, um, they'll, they'll migrate through Laramie at different times. Um, and, and certain species we, we're more likely to see in late summer and fall, like the Rufus hummingbird. We don't see them as frequently in the spring because their spring route Either they're just, they're bypassing the state and they're heading straight to their breeding grounds or they're using a different route altogether for their spring migration. And then at the end of July, you'll see a ton of Rufus hummingbirds all of a sudden when you know you, you hadn't seen one all year. And it's because that fall route, a lot of them are stopping at feeders and flowers on their way south. And then black chin hummingbirds, you really only see in the Western part of the state, calliopes uh, more in the Northern parts of the state they'll all migrate through the whole state at any given time. It's just your chance of finding them uh, go up if you're in the right spots. Hmm. Great, yeah, that, that's awesome. All right, so to the, to the one caller, speaking of plant lots of flowers, yes. So this is um, a Habitat Hero Garden that I'm showing, which is a program that Audubon Rockies manages and it's really about um, helping uh, landowners and, and communities um, provide habitat for, for birds and pollinators. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a whole process you can go through. And so if you're interested, I suggest you go through it. If this makes you feel a little bit intimidated and inadequate as a gardener, that's fine. You don't have to start right here. This is, this is you know, expert level right here. Um, you can get started with um, something as simple as just a container. Um, I This is a container that I planted in my backyard and I um, added to this a penstemon one day and the very next day, and I am not exaggerating, I am sitting out there on my porch with a cup of coffee and I about scalded myself because a hummingbird came out of nowhere. And, you know, literally the very first morning that it was available, the hummingbird arrived. So. I'm a believer, you, you know, if you, if you plant it, they will come. So, um, and it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a gorgeous landscape. It can just be a small section. All right, so uh, where to get started? How do you even know what to plant? Um, Barnyards and Backyards came out with a Wyoming pollinator guide just for us. It's really great, has a lot of inf great information. Audubon, has a native plants database that is pretty cool. And I'm sorry for the screen quality of this, but um, basically all you do with this is you enter in your zip code and then you search and it comes up with all the native plants that would grow in your area um, and what birds it might attract. So if so, if you, even if you already have these plants in your garden, then maybe you're asking yourself, you know, who would this, you know, who would this um, attract? And so if you've got some balsam root, you know, different types of warblers and finches might be interested in it. Um, um, provide, so it's just, it's a really great resource. All right. So here's where I'm willing and, and able to answer any questions that anyone might have uh, for me or for Zach. Well, I got a question. You kind of touched on it going throughout the whole presentation, but maybe in a more concise manner, can you talk about identification of birds, how, where to start? What do I look for? Maybe this is my first time doing this. What, what should I really try and pay attention to? What are the first characteristics? Right. So step one is um, you were looking for the size of the bird, right? You don't need to go and look through your bird guide um, in the mallards, you know, waterfowl section if you're looking at this bald eagle. This is clearly, even if you don't know this is a bald eagle, this is clearly a large bird, um, does not have webbed feet, it's got a hooked bill, 
Um, and this guy's easy to identify because he's so big. But generally speaking, you can eliminate most birds just by looking at size alone. Um, you know, and even where, where are you at? You're in Wyoming and it's summertime versus I'm in Wyoming and it's wintertime. You know, letting you know where you're at kind of also will narrow down what it is that you're, what you could be looking for. Um, and then it's sort of like the, the details. What is the color? Um, and I suggest before you ever pick up your binoculars, you know, um, in fact, I'll go back. Um, you want to be looking for all of these things first, because if you go and you know, you go grab your bird guide right away, that bird is probably gonna leave because that is the one thing that birds do is they leave when you wanna see them. So while it's there and it's in front of you, you wanna get as much detail as you can. Um, what size is it? What shape is it? What is it doing? Is it swimming? Is it on a tree branch? Is it, you know, running along um, through the grass? Um, uh, um, all of those types of things. And then you can kind of, if you have more time, you can go back and look at some more specific details. Um, let me kind of just run back through, find. So for example, if we're looking at these hummingbirds, um, they can be, especially if you're looking at, these ones are easy. One's got a purple, um, I can't remember what the specific thing It's, it's not quite there yet. It, it's it's okay. going. Um, I think you're trying to get back to the first image that you showed of the hummingbirds. Is that where you should be? I should be on the one that's the black chinned and the rufous. Yeah, you're not quite there yet. Oh no. Okay. Well, when we I'm get looking there, at the garden. <laughs> um, there it is. So they're both hummingbirds. So you know, if you that's that's definitely one thing. Um, one is definitely a lot bigger, right? One is overall just kind of that orangey color. Um, the other one has that kind of typical greenish um, look to it. Um, you know, so these are the things, first off, looking at those things. If these guys are really great to tell apart because one has got that purpley black chin and the other one's got that kind of, you know, more rusty colored. So that's, that's a lot easier. That's when you can go and very easily look back at your little guide, even if it's this one, and it'll kind of, um, you know, lay that out for you that those are easy to tell. And so when you look at birds like this, right, you know, if you just got a quick glimpse of this, they both are have green on their back, they both have red on their chin, and if you don't have them right next to each other, it'd be hard to identify the different sizes. So this is when you look at things like, um, what does that look like on the chin? You see how there's like actually some white running through that. This is like advanced level, right? Birding, and you may not get to that. So that's that's kind of where we get to. You start with just the main things, and then as you can, you can you can go down the line. But it's a journey, right? You you start right. somewhere, and you try and capture in your mind what that bird looked like before it leaves. Capture capture as many details about it. Where it's where it's at. Is it in a tree? Is it on the ground? Was it flying? Those kind of things, right? Capture as much detail as you can. Then look at your birder book, and if it's still there, then get your binoculars and try and see. Right. Um, but yeah, but I think the more you do it, it's just like everything. The more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it, right? And it's a fun fun thing to try and do and, and learn about. Yes, you know, and, and you do get skills. And I will say that um, one thing, I think I'm, you know, a little bit more old school and I do like my actual in-hand guides, but I will say the, the nice thing about the online app guides is that it really does walk you through the process of what you mentally do need to check off to identify a bird. Um, if, when you, when you click those, you know, what size, you know, what type of bird, what's it doing, you know, what are some of the colors, those types of things. And you keep saying what size. So do we need to get a tape measure out and try and measure them? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you're just kind of, it's relative to what. So a lot of the questions are, is it sparrow sized or smaller? Is it robin sized? Is it, um, you know, is it duck size or goose size or, you know, and then that kind of weeds out just relatively. So not necessarily is it six centimeters, um, but one of the, one of the fun ones, 
is our uh, two of our woodpeckers we have in Wyoming, the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. And they are both look very similar, very same coloration. And the way you tell them apart is that one's beak is longer than the other. And so what you're looking for is, is its beak shorter than the width of its head or is it as long as the width of its head? And that's how you identify those. And so you have to look really fast. <laughs> While they're hammering on a tree, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. So there, if I understand correctly with the Audubon, uh, you guys have a citizen science program to where people can volunteer and get involved. And maybe that's also a, another opportunity for people to learn more detailed and get better at birding and better at IDing and learning more. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so citizen science projects or community science projects, these are all just activities that regular folks can uh, participate in to learn more um, about the biodiversity around them. Um, you know, Audubon has been managing and has organized um, the Christmas bird count, which is you know, well over a hundred years old now. It's the longest running citizen science project. We know a lot of what we know about birds today because of, um, because of that project. Uh, right now, we're, we're learning about where birds go, how far they migrate, where they're, where they're at, all because of citizen science who participate in a, um, a data capture project called eBird. And I'll show you what that app looks like. It's right here. I don't know if you can see that. You'll have um, to stop sharing for us to see that. Okay. Um, and then and, hold it up a little longer. So basically you just uh, have a checklist of what you see, um, species checklists, and then I, I can't, it's all. Yeah, it, it's pretty tough but, to see. Yeah, it, but so there's an online version on your, on your desktop that you can do, but then when you're out in the field, you can just be checking off all the different things that you see and you submit that and it goes to scientists and we really do get real-time data about where birds are and where they exist and compare it from different years. Um, you know, a lot of, we have Audubon chapters and these are volunteer networks of people who like to go out and bird watch and do this type of thing. And they've got decades, literally decades here in Wyoming and all across the nation of notes of birds and when they saw them and how many there were. And it's, you know, it's like, what, what all this data is just sitting in notebooks in someone's, you know, library or, or office or, you know, in their den. So what do you do with all this data? You know, even historic data can be uploaded to eBird. Current data, data right now, you could do it, you know, Jeff, right now, I don't want to warn, I don't want to scare you, but you do have an Oriole on your shoulder. You can yes. put that in there, let everybody know. And you know what, if you try to call that, a, um, a flamingo. There's actually people that here in Wyoming, because every state has got their own little auditors, would be like, you know what, Jeff, that was not a flamingo. Um, <laughs> it's just not possible. So you don't have to feel like, you know, I'm not good enough at birding. You're good enough at birding to do eBird. So that's a fun one. So they could just search for eBird on Google or whatever and pull it right up. Yep. So it's just, just an E with the word bird, right? eBird, yes. Um, and there's lots of other projects. Project Nest Watch, if you're watching nests that you can participate in. Um, every President's Day weekend is the Great Backyard Bird Count. 15 minutes, wherever you're at, with kids, at a classroom, with your family, wherever. Um, and then, of course, we've got our bird banding stations. You mentioned wanting to see the owl fluorescence, guys. And I'm here to tell you that you can do this in the fall with Zach up at Casper Mountain. So. Um, that's an opportunity that you can. I, I think I'm looking for an invite, Jeff, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> what, so where can people go and, and look at these opportunities to get out and, and get with those group of people and experience some of this stuff? Do you have a website that they can look at or, or, or anything yeah. that way or a Facebook page to follow? Well, we do have a Facebook page, Audubon Rockies, um, dot, dot org. Um, we do have a, um, a website or um, a Facebook page. We have a, a, a website. We've got Instagram. I think we even have Twitter, although I don't do Twitter. So, um, but yes. <laughs> uh, 
um, but audubonrockies.org. Um, even if you just put in Audubon, it would lead you to the national organization. You could find us that way. But on audubonrockies.org, you can find the chapters, which are the local volunteer groups. Um, so if you wanted to get involved with um, going on a bird hike or, 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 you know, learning more about opportunities right now, and I don't, I think it might have already passed, but the Cheyenne Audubon chapter did something really fun, or maybe it was Laramie. I'm sorry, folks, if I got it wrong. Um, because we have to practice social distancing, but people still want to get out and bird, they are, um, they are doing sections where people can get out and bird, but they don't going to be next to each other, so they can do this whole waterway. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a neat way. You can, you can bird a section and, and, uh, and still be outside doing what you enjoy. Great. Well, any other questions out there? Last chance. I don't think so. Jacqueline, thank you so much for, for your time and joining us on the show. I think it was just fabulous. Hopefully we can have you back sometime soon and maybe we can dive into some other specific topics about birds. But I think that was a great starter off this spring to get people out there and looking at birds and, and learning, right? So thank you very much for your time. With thank that, you. Jenny, if you'd put up, oh, I think she beat me to the punch. She's, Thanks, she's ahead of you, Jeremiah. She is all the time. Um, so for, for everyone, we've talked about the Barnyards and Backyards website. So uh, Jenny is sharing the URL and what the Barnyards and Backyards website would look like. If you want to connect with us with these Barnyards and Backyards live shows, uh, we have a list there of, of upcoming shows and then shows such as this that we're just getting done. We're going to record. We have recorded those. We're going to post it up on uh, up onto that website so you can find that and watch it again or, or share it with someone else. Also, you can, you can get back on there and some of the links that we talked about, we're going to try and upload those here in the next week or so and get those available to you. So you can reference all that material. The, the next thing is if you want to connect with us, uh, UW extension, we have County offices statewide, one in every County at least, and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. So please connect. If you have any specific questions from the show, or if you want to learn more, uh, please contact your local extension office and, and talk to those extension educators. And then the last thing we have, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear about how well we're doing with this show, and we need our your input and your feedback on the show. So two things. If you're on the Zoom call, you will be prompted in your uh, internet browser for an, a quick evaluation. And if you take some time and feed, uh, fill that out and send it to us, it's quick, easy, click submit when you're done. We really appreciate it. The other thing is, uh, I believe Jenny Thompson has put uh, a link in the Facebook comments. So if you have a chance to uh, give us input there as well, we really appreciate it. With that- to um, go visit the Audubon Rockies website. They have a fantastic amount of information. If you're interested in birding, just getting started or more advanced, they have lots of things to offer there. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. And again, thank you, Jacqueline, for joining us today. It was a fabulous show. With that, goodbye, everybody. Have a good day and have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.